uh, we'll move on before uh, to our third speaker, Maria X. Um, I just want to remind Maria, um, please uh, speak slowly uh, because we've been uh, uh, the uh, translators are having difficulty um, um, keeping up with us. Thank you very much, Maria. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I will uh, do my best to remember to speak slowly. I do tend to speak fast, so do you remind me if I if I lose it. Um, sure. So thanks for inviting me, and and thanks uh, to the previous speakers. Um, uh, it's really interesting to hear you, and I think we I, I share a lot of the reflections and, and concerns that have been expressed. So. Um, so I will um, talk about digital intimacies um, in live performance encounters. And I will start with a love story, which I think is, is, is appropriate for this context. Um, first, a disclaimer to say this isn't, um, I come from academia, this isn't an academic paper, it's very much a paper of, uh, kind of presentation, it's not a paper from the perspective of my experience. Um, as a participant and audience member in many performances that have taken place online and digital spaces over many years, and as a, um, a, um, um, a collaborator of those artists through curatorial practice primarily. Um, and I am going back quite a long time. Um, so this is Aurea, an artist called Aurea Harvey. And those are stills from her in a platform called hell.com. Aurea is an American artist, American born, who um, is one of the most important, I think, in my view, net artists. Um, net art um, famously has died many times, as many net art commentators and critics um, have um, gleefully um, uh, expressed in the past. Uh, but um, it has it is really interesting to revisit as a type of work that was born um, through and for the internet and the online space, and I think particularly relevant to our current state. So Aurea um, Harvey met Michael Samin on Hell.com in ninety nine. Uh, and hell.com was a members only website where it was quite infamous at the time and it was frequented by a number of net artists of, of, um, of the active um, around that time. And this um, little story that I'm sharing with you now, you can find on uh, Rhizome's anthology of net art. Um, so uh, this is the story of a love affair, as I said, Aurea and Michael um, fell in love. Uh, Aurea was based in New York and Michael was based in Gand in Belgium at the time, both net artists. Um, and Aurea had founded Entropy.com, which was um, a net art outlet, also a kind of online digital design outlet, and had which had already won a couple of Webby Awards. So she quite an important net artist already at that point. Um, sorry, uh, Maria, can I just ask you to slow down, please? Thank slow you. Slow down, very sorry. Much. Yes. It, but, actually, uh, yeah. rather, as well as slowing down, maybe to leave a little pause. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, so, in 99, Harvey and Samin shared um, their first collective um, collaborative project which was called Skin on Skin on Skin. And it wasn't a live performance. It was a, an install, a net art installation piece, which was available to view um, as pay-per-view on hell.com. And that is the first uh, page of Skin on Skin on Skin. So um, immediate, you're hit by skin if in the frame of um, your computer screen and as a digital um, image. Um, skin on Skin on Skin was a series of love letters to each other um, and the piece consisted of 15 love letters um, through which the artists narrated the story of their love affair, um, their remote love affair. 
and the question was how does one and one become one um, through the wires as it were. So really it's a very simple story of, of a remote um, love affair. Um, so yes, I think th this is just another slide from the Rhizome anthology, anthology and you can just see some stills from the piece. So this leads me to a performance that has um, influenced me deeply, um, a, a piece called Wirefire, which was a durational performance that took place from 99 to 2003 and which was Aurea and um, Michael's second piece that they did together. So by that point, they were Entropy and Super, they were a collective and developed work together. Wirefire, and this can be um, found on Bitforms, I've got the link here, um, on a net art um, archaeology piece where there are links to stills of the work, and just to say the work isn't available anymore online, which is um, very sad. Uh, so Wirefire was an online performance that occurred weekly, every Thursday night at midnight uh, for four years. Uh, uh, Aurea describes the work as techno-romanticism. And so um, the intention was to uh, use the internet as a site for human connectivity and to kind of counter the cold, uh, the coldness, um, if you want, of the machine. Um, the piece was handmade with Flash and JavaScript, and it, it was, for me, the experience was like watching um, a VJ, a live VJ performance. So it wasn't a theatrical performance in the sense of um, traditional characters and a story with a beginning, middle and end. It was very much a, um, a visual performance um, that was, uh, uh, had characters where the, the uh, Aurea and Michael were the protagonists and had the backbone of a story, which was the story of their love affair. Um, at the end of every performance, the artist would take a photograph to document every piece. And that was, um, for me, it was one of the first works that I encountered of this type. And indeed, it was the first online uh, durational performance or recurring performance of this type. Um, I will show you some stills of the work, as I said, um, it's not possible to access live uh, kind of videos of the work anymore, recorded videos of the work. And so you can see they are very particular kind of um, a, a visual aesthetic. Um, the work uh, was very much a collage, so that's why I described it as VJ. It brought together images that the artists were creating with some found material. It used visuals, um, sonic uh, found material and also text. Um, the text was, wasn't narrating a story. It was mostly used uh, as part of the visuals. Um, you can see, I'll go back um, in some slides. Um, we'll find one in, in a minute. You can see the webcams. So uh, originally there weren't webcams there and then th they were added. So the artists were, you could see them live in some floating webcams that would appear and disappear. Um, there's one here. And here you can also see um, a text um, um, chat um, um, window. So on occasion, audiences could um, text um, into kind of chat with the performers in real time. Um, this was occasional, it wasn't a permanent function. Um, sometimes the artists would respond and sometimes they wouldn't. And quite often the audience responses would gradually kind of direct the trajectory of the performance towards a particular um, area or kind of visual, the visual materials would respond to those comments on occasion. 
but you, you it wasn't a linear uh, type of interaction so you couldn't bank on that um i still have I have some more slides just because i love their visual so much and i think um they give you a sense of um how visually lush the piece was um and the the audiences, um, I wasn't able to find a slide where you could see that, but the audiences were also visible on the screen as specks of dust. So it was obviously a very abstract representation of the people watching the performance. But what this did was made you feel present and made you feel present with others. So being a speck of dust on that screen with, uh, with other specks made you, gave you a sense that you were there with others in a community sharing this live experience together. So I was one of the big, big fans of Wirefire, as you can tell. I um, was following the performance over um, the four years that it was live. And um, I think it's one of the, for me, it's one of the most um, uh, iconic, I would say, uh, works of online performance uh, in terms of how intimate the piece was. And there was a lot, uh, there were many reasons for that. Um, the fact that it was uh, taking place at midnight in itself meant that you were likely to be at home uh, without any distractions of family or work. Um, it was dark. Um, you could make that experience very intimate if you wanted. Um, the fact that it was um, it was a, a real love love affair, and perhaps that did make the piece intense um, as an exchange in that, and that was palpable through the wires, in in a way that I haven't experienced many times elsewhere. There were characters that you could identify with, so Aurea and Michael were the characters of the piece. And there was a story, there was the story of their love affair, uh, but there wasn't a narrative um, in that you needed to follow and there weren't um, language barriers because the story didn't rely on a particular language to, for it to be um, told. There was continuity and commitment. And so Jill uh, mentioned the term commitment. I think um, it's really interesting we can to talk about that later. But it was very much an act of commitment going back to that performance um, from the performers and from the audiences. And um, as I said before, there was very much a sense of community, of being there together, of being able to rely on each other for turning up every Thursday or most Thursdays, a sense of going home into that performance, a, a sense of intimacy. The live encounter was exciting and there was an element of surprise. The fact that sometimes the performers would interact with you and sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes uh, you could chat and sometimes you couldn't. Sometimes they were present in a little camera bobbing along the screen and sometimes they weren't. Um, it was all um, making each live encounter really special and different and kind of um, uh, surprising in a different way. Um, and occasion, um, yes, no, I, talk, I, I talked about the real-time interaction, so I think I've covered this slide. So this is Aurea and Michael uh, at their home in Gang, which um, I visited. Um, so the end of the love affair is that they did um, uh, get married in the end and, and Aurea moved to Belgium and they have been working together ever since, developing really um, interesting work such as KISS, one of the first 3D um, scanning performances. So they scanned their bodies in a KISS and it, it's a very kind of technologically very imperfect Piece, but really interesting again in how visceral it is as a digital artwork. Um, sorry, I'll go back. And then they developed Tale of Tales, which was a, an indie kind of a games uh, development studio. So this is just an example of a performance that for me was um, 
interesting in how it managed to achieve a sense of intimacy um, through a remote digital encounter. And I have done a lot of kind of work um, on that um, area of performance and intimacy. This is a book that resulted from a festival uh, I did with Rachel Zerihan at Goldsmiths a very long time ago, back in 2007, and some of you um, uh, were there and contributed. Um, and the still is from a, an artist called Jaime Del Val, who performed at the Intimacy Festival. The works that we presented, some were very much one-to-one -one encounters in real space, very visceral physical encounters, such as the one that Jill described, and some were digital. Uh, and we were very interested to look at the types of intimacy that were possible through the, the different media and how that translated and um, the, how the audience engaged with those types of works. Um, so in the case of Jaime, for example, his performance was in real space. Um, it could easily have been a, a live screening because what he did as a dancer with his um, dancer collaborator was to um, perform um, within a space with pr projection, um, 360 projections, um, and the projections were of physical landscapes of their bodies um, that were generated by micro cameras worn on their bodies, on, on and inside their bodies, different parts of the bodies. And sometimes you could tell which part of the body that was, and sometimes you couldn't. So the result was kind of bodily landscapes, I call them, really, um, again, beautiful, kind of evocative, um, bodily landscapes that moved quite seamlessly from the physical to the digital space, uh, creating five minutes more a, 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 a visceral um, experience. Thank you. So we're coming to the day, and obviously we've been hit by coronavirus, and we can't have intimate encounters of any kind. Um, and many companies um, moved to that space of um, online work. Um, in different ways. Um, we talked about a National Theatre Live that was happening before, and again, we can talk more about this later because I do think that the way that liveness is understood in that context as not a real-time connection, but as a, the sense of a live experience is interesting. But NT moved its theatre to home, so its national theatre home over the period of the pandemic. Uh, theatres that had never um, developed work for or digital or online did during this time, such as the Almeida in London and Bush Theatre did a series of what they called theatre films in response to Black Lives Matter. Uh, Belarus Free Theatre opened a school of, for fools online for the first time. I did an online premiere and performers um, were mixed together uh, from 15 different live locations. And my colleague Hannah Balu uh, developed her uh, performance art piece, Guga 2, um, a work, very visceral, a live performance work about the pregnant female body as a film. Uh, some interesting um, uh, performances that used the restrictions of um, COVID in an interesting manner were things like performances like Theatre in Quarantine, a live theatre laboratory that live streamed out of an East Village closet uh, measuring eight square feet. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you followed that. Uh, I think they have produced about 20 live performances during this time, all streamed live out of a cupboard. And that created really interesting restrictions in terms of the physical space and how the body is placed in that physical space um, that um, I, I think really added to the work. And then I would like to refer also to Lynn Luce Epi's Skinship as part of a new season of care, in which the artist invited participants to bathe together apart, 
so the invitation was to attend the performance from your bath um, while um, uh, having a bath and you could keep your camera on or off or um, you could use filters and so on. But it was about having this shared corporeal experience through the online space. And things like Dream, um, a work by Royal Shakespeare Company, and um, other companies, um, which was inspired by Shakespeare's uh, Midnight Summer Dream and uh, was developed using motion capture um, into um, the epic um, Unreal Games, Unreal Engine. Um, so it was meant to be an immersive experience, but it was experienced online. Um, so that's some of the stills of this work and the um, participants, the audiences, um, were, were, you, were moving around those fireflies that you can see here in the images and the fireflies were kind of guiding the action. Um, I have various thoughts about this piece and we can dis discuss this later. That's just another still. It didn't quite work for me. I don't think I have much time to go into this now, but I can say more about this later. So performance online, um, is it a compromise of the body in space? Um, do we compromise being together with others in real space? Do we compromise that sense of immersion we get in physical performance, the sense of liveness and of experience? Is it an opportunity for autonomy and descent? being able to bypass the theater space and to stream work from any kind of space, uh, including one's cupboard? Um, is it an opportunity for a different kind of intimacy, such as um, the type of intimacy that Oria and Harvey developed through their practice? For reaching out to wider audiences, not the primarily white middle-class audiences that uh, tend to go to the theater space. Um, and for experimenting with new hybrid forms of theatre that people here have been doing for a long time. It's both, I think it's both, and uh, we can continue to have that conversation. Um, uh, I share some of Jill's concerns, but I also do think there's wonderful opportunities to be had for encounters that aren't possible in physical space and are possible in digital space. So it isn't about um, an either or, it is about a richness. Um, and I appreciate that right now the option isn't there, uh, but it will be with us again. So it's about, I think now is the time and the opportunity to experiment with what we have and to enrich um, our performance practices. Um, and to do that, I would suggest what we need to do first and what I think um, there is to learn from Aurea and Michael's work is that we need to work with that absence and with the loss we've suffered through the pandemic and the loss of the physical body in the digital space. We need to work with what is not there rather than conceal this absence or try to replace it or pretend that it is there or try to um, duplicate and simulate the conditions of um, physical visceral presence. We need to work with the constraints, the limitations, the imperfections that we have in the online space, the size of the cupboard or um, the fact that we are bathing separately, but at the same time, we need to work with our vulnerabilities in the digital space. And we need to extend to each other, to audiences and to um, through performance, an invitation to a shared experience, um, which for me, the um, wildfire piece very much did, but so did Lynn Lu's piece um, on of joint uh, bathing. So there are uh, many ways of achieving that, uh, many of which don't actually require big budgets, um, such as um, the budgets that supported the work of DREAM. Um, that's all for me, and it'd be interesting to have a conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Jill, Rakini, and Maria. Um, maybe this will spotlight everyone. So we're going to uh, open um, uh, for Q&A. And, &A. and um, so um, the way we're going to do it is we have, you, you can type your questions um, on the chat. And we have chat moderators who will, who will um, present the questions to the three speakers. Um, or you can click through the, um, the video itself. Um, so I, I guess I will start off. Um, um, what I found very um, prominent in the three conversations was the idea of absence and the extension of absence and how we work with absence and the extension of extending absence so that we can create um, a shared um, experience. Um, and, and I think for, for me, the idea of um, first starting this festival was actually the idea of, you know, uh, the absence of the Magdalena Festival and the absence of, um, you know, meeting my collaborators in the absence and, 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 and therefore the idea of the festival came about. So I will stop here. I will not speak anymore. And I, I, I open the floor uh, to the participants here. Uh, so over to um, you, does anyone have any questions? Um, and yeah, Marie, maybe the chat moderator, Helen, can you get, could I do notice that there are some questions in there, the chat? Yeah. There, well, there were not so many questions. There were a lot of really um, interesting comments, uh, which I, didn't catch all of because there was so many, but um, there was there was the comment in response to not having eye contact um, that Karenza made right at, during Jill's um, talk uh, about having the camera off and on, and if the audiences also have their camera on, they can be present, and even if it's not eye contact, it is a connection and a, and a reaction that, that can happen. Um, Janaina commented about the light being very important. This was when Maria was talking about um, uh, Wi Fi being in the night and how, how the daylight can make it very distracting. Although I would answer to that that most of the times when I watched Wi Fi, which was an incredible piece, I was in New Zealand and it was daylight, it was the middle of the day. Um, and okay, my bedroom at that time where I was, was, was not the brightest room, but I was completely um, engaged and there not distracted at all. Um, here's a question here from Clara. Some artists are working with low-tech adaptations of medical and gaming gadgets to expand presence, physicality, consciousness in our relation with the computer and the virtual. Does Maria know some of these examples of artists working with um, adaptations of medical or gaming gadgets? No, no, I don't know of any artists working with medical gadgets. So it would be very interesting to find out. Um, there, there, there are many artists working with games, but um, Perhaps it would be it, be it would be good to understand what um, I can't remember the name of the person who asked the question, uh, Clara. What Clara, Clara. means by gadgets? Uh, that would be it would be interesting if she could give us examples. But it sounds uh, very good. Um, maybe Clara is writing about that. But I've there's a question from Leticia. Um, I have thought this is a privileged place, as not everyone has access to good internet. Here in Brazil, many times people don't even go to the theatre. How to think about generation and democratisation of the audience for online plays? Is it? I think it's a question for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, any one of the speakers would like to take that question first and then we can yeah. um, I, I, and then I'll go first just to, just to say yeah. that, <laughs> that being the Luddite here I just want to thank the other two for really opening up some doors for me and, 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 and actually highlighting some work that was obviously from the comments work that has had a, 
profound effect on people. So many thanks for that. I have no idea. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about the democratization of of work, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Letitia. If you're talking about the, the the work being accessible to to younger audiences who are really using technology, um, or if you're talking about um, democratization of work for people who haven't got computers, you know. So uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. So I'd just like you to clarify that. Maybe somebody else has got something to say. No. Can I say, can I respond to say, I think a lot of the most interesting work that has developed in um, kind of online spaces is actually um, work that is low tech and doesn't require access to particularly um, uh, fast internet connections or strong computers, etc. And a lot of the artists here, uh, Helen, um, Susan, um, um, Christina, have been developing that type of practice for a long time. And so I know that, for example, um, uh, Helen um, Avatar Body Collision did work online, and I know that um, you wanted to use um, browsers uh, um, so that uh, the work would be accessible for people who didn't have um, kind of particularly fast connections and so on. Um, and I've, I have found this um, those platforms and those practices very helpful in working with different types of communities in areas which aren't um, particularly wealthy or which don't have access to high-tech high, uh, high tech technologies. Um, and those would include, um, you know, places like schools in Greece, for example, where um, the education had to go online like everywhere else this year. Um, the schools in Greece, like in many other parts of the world, are very um, underfunded and have very little access to technology. And so I have um, had some workshops with teachers to look at platforms that would facilitate um, online performance uh, for, 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 from people's phones or from you know, whatever platforms they have, whatever access to technology they have and they can share. Um, and I think that is... Um, I think that the question of digital poverty is um, pertinent to some types of practices, but not, but, but not to all. Yeah, maybe I could just chip in and say something. It's, it's Helen speaking. Um, with, with Upstage, the platform that Avatar Body Collision developed, we, when we began with that, one of our members was on a dial-up internet connection in a rural area um, where she had things like lightning strikes and electric fence pulsing um, that, that often impacted on her connection. And from the very outset, we were conscious, um, not only for that reason, but also from the point of view of the audience, that we wanted to, to prioritise accessibility. Obviously, you have to have the internet. <laughs> You've got to have some kind of internet connection, otherwise you you cannot participate in online performance. Um, but we have always found that being able to do something clever with very little is much more interesting than having a huge budget and all the technology in the world, because then you often come out with something that actually, actually is, is, well, from what I've seen, often very lazy work because people just think they can throw all the money at it and get 3D animation and all this kind of whiz bang things, which looks really sexy, but the content is very um, lazy. Yeah, so I've, yeah, my, my work is really at the low tech end of the spectrum and, and the accessibility for, for audiences as well as the artists is really important. Thank you. Um, I have a question for all three panelists, actually. I think it, it, it's um, the idea of um, erasure. And I think it's something that uh, Rakini brought up about the whole ritual and the rasa and the senses. And Maria left us with the idea that of extending to work with the absence and to expand 
uh, the shared experience itself and with the example of Lynn Luz now. Um, so my question right now is the whole idea of um, senses, the embodied senses, and how can we at this moment right now uh, look at extending um, the space, you know, um, particularly if we are supposed, particularly as we all know, uh, well, the Singapore government has declared that the virus is here and we have to learn to live with it, you know. So how do we, with, the, with, with that in thought, you know, what are your thoughts um, on the idea of working with the absence of senses in, and, to, and how can we extend this into a shared experience itself? Maybe I can start with Rakini because the Rasa uh, created a, an idea. Yes, for me I there. mean, what I found most interesting was to be honest, last year I was absolutely saturated with online performance, Zoom meetings, all of that. Um, normally I have all my tech needs, you know, working with a filmmaker or whatever, somebody else does it, but it was just like, I'm, I'm with Jill on that, you know, like a lot of my work also, which is one-on-one -on -one and which includes eye contact, all of that. But what came out of that was like a new relationship with one's body, which is what, um, um, you know, finding ways of, I mean, my task is not to extend my work into an online arena. I really am not interested in that. I'll do it because I have to, because that's what the situation is. And I'm interested in, in work that, like I said, I, was, I saw this show a few weeks ago, which was very interesting. And with works that were streamed live, that they were also interesting. So um, from being really anti, you know, everything online, Zoom and all of that, I've sort of go through stages, you know. So um, the, the exhibition was my way of dealing with the, the isolation and of creating spaces with just um, the, the concept of the presence of a body, which was not there. So that was an interesting concept. So even in my paintings or the, these uh, structures that I created, there was a sense of a presence um, but there was no body. So that was the feeling feeling of it. And so that was sort of satisfying for me. But then uh, unlike a lot of other people, um, I did have um, an audience eventually. Um, the first time I did a, a work, I was alone in a studio. None of my collaborators could come. And I discovered something absolutely new that I started painting on the floors like, um, you know, like in India, we've got columns. So I started working and doing these elaborate chalk paintings, etc. So, I mean, I think what I was trying to say is that we have resources within our bodies, which are like archives. And, you know, there's an endless, um, you know, archive of, of possibilities that come from our, you know, from our embodied knowledge. And that's what interests me at the moment, you know, it's a challenge. Um, it's not something I want to embrace, but it's a challenge, it's here. Um, and like at this moment, you know, uh, one of the things that broke my lonely uh, lockdown last year was a conference. And I felt really rejuvenated for a few days, but like as Jill says, you know, sometimes the encounters even heightens your loneliness because the minute that's over, you're in your solitary environment, you know. So it it's um, it does have that the ability to. I forgot what your question was. Even I'm just rambling now. I'm sorry. It's getting close to my bedtime, so I'm just <laughs> rambling here. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, uh, Jill. Any uh, any thoughts to what Rakini said and the question that I had? Yeah. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm really reflecting on a lot of these things. What I found during lockdown was not the desire. It was I, I kind of accepted what was happening in quite a, I think, quite a graceful way, really. Um, I, I live somewhere very beautiful. 
there was plenty of places for me to to walk and to um, be alone in nature. And that became actually the most precious practice. Um, I suddenly could feel and notice for the first time in my life, I think, the seasons as they change. Every time I went to the woods, you know, I saw how the flowers had grown, how they died, how the next set of flowers came up. So this was an incredibly rich um, period of time. And I, I talk about it, we have a, a, a term in Welsh, which is the, uh, the Milter Squire, which means the square mile. And I think I just focused on my square mile. I couldn't go abroad. I couldn't meet all my friends, which has always been the balance for me of living in the country that every few months I could get on a plane and go and be with people intensely. I have none of that. But I did did come come into commune with with nature in such an important way, and my work before lockdown has has been in exploring silence and quietness and quietude, and really it's just allowed it to intensify. So I think instead of looking for the opportunities to go online, blah, 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 I I went the other direction, and just went a bit backwards and a bit more into my past and to, to when we didn't have theatre, I don't know, but, and found great, great beauty. And that's still my solace really. And the pro my, what I worry about is I actually feel quite strongly that it's, it's going to be quite obscene to get on an airplane. Uh, it, it feels like an obscenity to me now, not just because of climate change, but, but, but in terms of listening to this year, and what it's meant. And I don't think we've, we've, we haven't heard everything that this year was trying to teach us yet. Uh, it needs a lot of reflection, but I mean, that's not helping with the, with the theme of the online work. I'm just, I'm the Luddite here. So I wanted to go and look at a lot of this work that you've been telling me about. So thank you. Um, Maria, sense of uh, ritual and I mean, yeah, maybe we can elaborate a little bit more about Lynn's, Lynn's work, you know, this whole shared experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking uh, in terms of what Jill was saying, um, I live in a very ugly place, <laughs> uh, which is very urban, and uh, it did uh, feel suffocating after a certain point, the fact that I couldn't escape the, the urban kind of environment um, without using public transport, which I couldn't do. Um, but what the, so what this resulted to for me, and sorry, that's a bit, that's not quite a response to your question, Elizabeth, sorry, it's a follow up from, from Jails and uh, uh, it, is, it resulted to me taking up more gardening. And so I have the privilege of having a garden at least. And kind of, for me, it was the, the, the touching the soil and the connection with the plants that saved me during this time. And as well as my children, which saved me both and both drive, drove me crazy at the same time. Um, but I was wondering whether this isn't a different type of commitment. So, you know, the, in normal times, we all travel around a lot, particularly artists and academics. We zoom around the planet and we, we hop on here and there and for, for short periods of time and it's beautiful to develop those short encounters but the year in um, wood green in my case uh, kind of led me into a different kind of commitment with my local space whatever whatever that was so both the garden but also the local the ugliness of, of the local space. And as a result of that, we've come together, a group of neighbors trying to fight for a bit of green land that the, the council wants to build on uh, near our houses. And um, so it's led to some kind of local activist action, if you like. So this isn't directly linked to performance, but for me, the, 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 the commitment issue is a big question and it is in online performance as well, particularly in platforms such as this. Uh, but I wonder whether it, it hasn't kind of led us to new types of commitment, different types of commitment to our locale and to, um, to, to not, you know, to animals and plants and different types of beings. And um, so, in terms of performance, 
Um, sorry, I'm not really, I'm not at all answering your question. <laughs> Because in terms of performance, I was still trying to follow on the chat and the question of inequalities and, and digital poverty really does concern me. It's something that um, it has concerned me in my academic kind of role. Obviously, we have had students who we needed to address the fact that there was digital poverty, they couldn't access courses online and so on. Um, but I, I wonder, again, has this situation made things better or worse or just different? So, again, in the past, um, um, the fact that we all travel a lot is a, a massive privilege and there are very many people, um, makers, makers, performers, artists and audiences who are not able to travel um, for financial reasons. They don't have the, 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 the resource. To, to live that lifestyle, are not able to connect with people from other parts of the world, are not able to have those to access to those cultural experiences. Um, I also recently took part in a, a, choreo a choreographic lab that isn't the one um, uh, that was talked about here by Rakini, uh, which was around technology and abel different types of ability and, and disability. I don't like the term, but so we talked a lot about access and um, uh, the, the, some people did say how wonderful it was for them that all the performances went online and they didn't have to negotiate all the difficulties of getting on the underground and getting into theater spaces which are really not designed for people the wheelchair users for example so sorry it's I, I'm, I'm rambling as well I don't have a, a kind of clear thread but I just have I'm really just really interested in the question of, of inequalities and, and digital poverty and the shift this has caused to access to, to issues of access. I'll shut up. No, um, I mean the issues of a, uh, um, disparity uh, is quite is quite prevalent. I mean, I think um, in 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 Philippines, um, I keep sharing this. You know, uh, what the government has done to reach out to the village was to use uh, radio waves and television to teach the children in the village. Uh, I think one of the story that went out was a student in Malaysia, you know, who just had uh, her a, 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 an old mobile phone in line and she climbed up just to sit in exams. And I, and I think that's a serious, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, that's a serious question, but I'm going to keep quiet right now. And Helen, yeah, Helen, you, there's someone else. Yes. Who was... uh, yeah, here's Mayana. Uh, and there's a question from uh, Carenza asking um, if the funding bodies, uh, institutions funding live performances and online performances, uh, if they are seeing online performances as relevant as live performances, or does it slip into new technologies, um, into categories of new technology? Should online performance be treated equally with live performances? Uh, has it created opportunities for new audiences in your experience? Just questions from Karenza. I guess to everyone. Um, um, can I speak? Um, I, I don't have any idea about funding or anything of that, uh, but I think it has become, especially here in Australia, it's become a necessity to have the option. So it's, um, I don't think it's being treated as a separate. So basically it's almost uh, goes without saying that if you have a, uh, an upcoming event, you know, you have to consider it. Even if it's a gallery, if it's, an, it's a visual exhibition, you have to um, consider whether, whether that's, um, um, going to be um, an option or not. So that's what's happening. Um, yeah, I have nothing else to say about that. I was sort of more or less wanting to still talk about the, the privilege factor because that whole aspect of the disparity of, of um, resources all over the world um, was just really struck me during the last conference because people couldn't even attend the, 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 the conference from places in various in India and the Philippines because they just didn't have that access. So yes, in some countries where it's uh, where we enjoy that privilege, yes, 
you know, it's um, it's being taken as as a given that if it, if it isn't a live performance, there will be that option to, um, you know, buy a ticket online or, or whatever. Um, Helen, um, or Maria, sorry, and then we go on to Helen. Um, yes, I would want to respond to the question about funding. And um, the Dream Online piece, which I briefly referred to, um, had a lot of funding, um, very significant. I can't remember how many millions of pounds this was. Um, it wasn't intended to be online. It was intended to be an immersive um, VR experience, but it became online due to the COVID restrictions. But I do think that there is the, the pandemic amongst all the damage and pain that it has caused. It also offers opportunities to artists working with those technologies and who have been doing so for a very long time to perhaps access uh, resources and uh, funding um, um, kind of sources that weren't available to them previously, because this was considered to be a peripheral kind of niche type of practice and suddenly it isn't, it is mainstream. And I actually think it's really important to do that and to engage with those works because there is a little bit of erasure of history that is happening um, at the same time when uh, the big organizations and big institutions jump on the bandwagon of online performance without acknowledging um, you know, the pioneers and the histories um, that have been um, written by uh, people such as Helen and others here and elsewhere. So I do hope that this will give opportunities for more funding for this type of work. And um, it will also give opportunities for different types of audience to access work that weren't necessarily, you know, that are not necessarily natural theater goers, that are people who wouldn't normally go to theaters or to institutions, kind of cultural institutions and so on. So I have to say something to this. <laughs> um, Maria has said a lot of what I what I would have said, but as someone who has been um, trying to access funding in this area for more than 20 years, it's extremely difficult and it still is. Um, for the, f until last year, it was difficult because nobody knew where to put us. So there have been different situations, like in Australia, for example, they had a very good um, scheme for quite a long time for, for digital arts. It was much better than in New Zealand. In New Zealand, they would put us sometimes in theatre or sometimes in visual arts, or they would, they kept coming up with different ways to categorise things. And quite often we just fell in between what they were wanting. And one of the biggest problems that still exists with, with accessing funding is the need for it to have a regional context. So my work is, the majority of it is really global, like I apply in New Zealand because that's where I'm from, or I apply, apply in Germany because that's where I'm living. But in fact, the work is happening all over the world. And I've found very, very, very few funds that really allow for that. Most of them, like if I apply for money in Germany, they say you have to have uh, the premiere and five performances in Germany. And I say, well, it's online. So does that count, <laughs> you know? And so there's, there's still this mentality and it's understandable because they get funding from tax or from other sources that are regional based. So and you, you can't kind of argue against most of it. Um, and yes, now there is suddenly a whole lot more money for this kind of work. But there's even more people that are asking for it. The, the competition is so much more. Um, you know, I've done in the last six months more than 10 funding applications for Upstage and they've all been rejected. Um, and, and then you get, of course, the big names that come in, like, like Maria was saying, that, that, that gobble up a lot of this money because they are the, the National Theatre or, or whatever a famous person um, and they're going to do this amazing, radical, new, never done before online performance. 
Um, and so the funders will think, oh, wow, this will be great and throw the money at them. Um, and just to finish it, um, something that Suzanne and Annie and I did uh, at the end of last year, we were so frustrated by all of these big theatre companies saying they were making their the first ever online this, that and the next thing. Um, so we put together a, a little five minute video and maybe Suzanne, I don't know if you've got the link at your fingertips, you could put it in the, the chat where we just really quickly asked people that we could easily ask, um, when was your first online performance? And then we put together a kind of, like they do the top of the pops, you know, the hits of the years going back um, and made this going back to 91. Uh, we could have gone back further or been more in more in depth, but we just wanted to do something really. Oh, sorry, I'm going too fast. It's because I'm passionate. <laughs> sorry, Eugenia. <laughs> yeah, I stop. Okay, Jill, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, just very briefly, because I just wanted to say, Helen, to Helen, it was ever thus, Helen. It was ever thus that this this is not a surprise that this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think what's but but I was really glad when you brought up the, the thing that you and Suzanne did, because I think those are the actions that are going to get get noticed when you start putting it back through history and creating those that kind of activist um, uh, uh, statements. So the more of that, the better. But but, you know, it's you won't get the funding. The National Theatre will get the funding. And that is is just how it is. So what do we do? You know, it's, 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 it's the same with trying to get money for women's stuff, you know, forget it. You know, women's experimental international, forget it. Nobody wants it. So what do you do? What's, what's, the, what's the step, um, the, the sideways step, as we say, in order to continue working and to create communities and, um, and keep working? Because we're not going to get the money, you know. We're well, I just keep money. doing it anyway, you know. I and know you do. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I'm I'm fortunate that I can do that. I know that not everybody is in such a position as I am that they can do that. Yeah. I, I want to go back to what Jill was talking. Uh, uh, you know, the whole idea of transcending the space, the frame. Um, I, um, because this will bring us uh, to our second day uh, panel, which is shifting practice, the idea of you know, breaking this frame. And the, and the very um, poignant example was Pavati's performance. Uh, you know, it was very evocative uh, in the sense that you know, I was really overwhelmed by that. And, it's a, and to be honest, I'm one of those um, people when I watch online, pieces, I just get bored, you know, I, I, I fidget, I look at my phone, I look at something else and, you know, there's a lot of distraction. But I, I think there's something to, to, to look at, you know, like this, this, this frame. And I think Maria shared about that in talking about this shared experience. And maybe we can, you know, um, have this, uh, uh, you know, I want to open this up to the floor and to the panel, you know, about transcending this, this, this space, you know, um, we, we know that a lot of the technology and the platform we use, these are means of communication and to connect, you know, uh, so, so, so how the, the rigid of this, you know, this frame um, is something that, you know, yeah, you know, to, to think about, to reflect, yeah. Rakini, yes. And to say, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Jill's performance of Daughter because that's, you know, that having just seen Parvati do, um, you know, what, you, what you've just said about transcending, um, I'm interested to see um, how this, you know, the intimacy of how we can um, share. And I mean, all we can do is really keep experimenting with this, whether we like it or not, because you know, I, like I have a work as well, which has a one-on-one, -on -one, um, uh, which I haven't tried, obviously, on uh, online. But um, like like you, Jill, I, I was also surprised with the feeling. I was just thinking that something like Parvati's singing 
could never be could never come you know I'd never be able to appreciate it because obviously I've seen her in the flesh and and you know I thought you know how can it be but you know she did actually prove it however not everybody does <laughs> and um you know like you said we have so many distractions and things but um like also which I said it's it's an area and it's a part of research that I look at as a challenge and so I you know I'm looking forward to just um looking at what all the other ex, you know experiments that people can do including myself and learn from it and also to learn a different way of of looking you know we're, we're also really um spoiled with different options and you know, um, and I think, you know, we have to be c continually educating ourselves in ways of looking at work because we just um, sink into, you know, apathy or whatever, you know, that happens with whatever that's going on. But anyway, I just wanted to say that about daughter. Uh, can I just say something? I, I would this this going back to this frame thing because it's it's a new you know the, I've been thinking about it but I've got no answers, and I um I'd be really interested to know because there's a lot of really interesting people in the audience or, or, or in the participants here today, just to really what other people are thinking about frame. If anybody's got any and any thoughts on it really, and um, how we can transcend this square rectangle that I fed up of looking at yeah so I don't know if maybe the moderators can find if you, maybe nobody's got any thoughts about it can I come in while we're collecting yes. thoughts um, and yes. so for me the types of work that have achieved that over the, the years are works such as um, wirefire um, and that's because of the commitment that you were talking about, Jill, before. So the, that, that work transcended the frame through repetition, through community, through the fact that we were going back right. every week in that relationship, in that encounter, revisiting that encounter. Um, other works that have um, kind of been able to transcend that frame for me are um, works such as... Um, for example, Blast Theory's work, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a British group called Blast Theory, who've been doing um, media art performance for many years, use gaming platforms and so on. And um, a lot of their work, um, more recent work, for example, an, an old work actually, um, it takes place on different platforms. So that kind of multi-platform development um, where the character might use Facebook and Twitter and email you and text you and call you and send you a letter in the post. Um, and kind of you can see that character develop through the different platforms before coming to your screen or as well as coming to your screen. And so there's, you, you still don't have the physical encounter, but at least it transcends the, the, the limitations of the screen by traveling in different types um, of encounters. And so there's a richness there in, in the connection. And um, what I find interesting in, in some of Blast Theory's work is that it asks you to go out and a lot of promenade performances do that a lot of um um kind of um what's it called G gaming performances where you have to to look for um clues in physical space for example and so you have to use your body um to engage with the work and that i think is the key which is very similar to lim lun's piece uh, which was a very simple invitation to just attend you know take part in the performance from your bath <laughs> But if you do that, you already are in a different situation. And so the screen, um, you already have a different relationship with the screen. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah, that's my response. There, there's been a few very, comments in the, yeah. in the chat. Yes. Um, Julie Robson said, said that, that she and Dawn um, will talk about this in their talk tomorrow and Bianca is also on the panel tomorrow, I think, and we'll be talking about um, this methodology of becoming instead of being and playful affinity with the audience. So these are things that you can join tomorrow's panel, which is, um, is it at the same time as today's? 
Uh, no, it's one, it's about lady. one hour later. Yeah. And the, la and the lady finger talk is um, actually for for us in Europe, it's it's the middle of our night tonight. Um, and then Carenza has said, but the camera can move. You can change the frame with your hands. The Zoom frame has to be your friend. Um, Clara says, I think it is time for new interfaces. Most of them not new, but but that can become more accessible to be put to work not only by artists, but in our everyday life. Um, I'm not sure if she's given any examples of what those are. Christina says, from my personal experience, the use of the chat box as the main stage where performers and audiences co-write the performance in real time, allowing them to interact, have a say, and why not take over coexisting in this shared space? So this is her way of breaking the frame. Um, and, uh, and Suzanne is... Oh, did I miss? Rams Ramsden, yeah. What did her... Ah, def frame is definitely a challenge. I, with others, have been trying by using the edges and off screen to see what is possible, trying to explode, break through, trick the frame. And there are some more. Suzanne agreeing it's nice to have the bodily experience and that uh, lady finger is this is julian dawn is at um 10 a.m in australia but this is 1 1 a.m or two what half past one in the morning for you jill and clara clara's given a link to census places which is a an online project i think it, it's an is that in the one in second life clara which is a, a virtual world um christina is talking about waitingforgodot.com, which was a very early um, online performance by Desktop Theatre, who, who were the people that I first got involved with online. Um, and they did Waiting for Godot in, in a chat room where the audience and the performers were literally in the same space. So like street theatre. And um, yeah, no frames or no boxes, but still the frame of the computer screen, obviously. But this one was where the, the audience could participate in the performance. And in this one, Godot arrived. So instead of waiting for Godot, <laughs> the audience took over and an audience member became changed their name to Godot and joined in the performance. Um, and Maria is mentioning wearables. So this is like mm. um, tech technology that you can wear that can be used like sensors or various different devices that are part of your costume. Clara says a webcam that captures your movement while you dance and moves an avatar. Yeah, so motion sensors. Um, Karenza wishes cameras were on. She wouldn't type so much. She'd raise her hands and say, yeah. So uh, Suzanne is talking about how old movies explored also how to, how to reach out from the frame which I think is similar to what Hillary said about, you know, there is a frame here, but things can happen just outside of it or reach into it or out of it. Um, Leticia watched plays that called you to, called you live to make a move or say a word with an open mic. And Suzanne thinks Jill won't like the technical aspects of senses. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of ideas there. Yeah. And actually, uh, tomorrow uh, we have a surprise for the way we are doing the format of the panel. So I'm looking forward because they want to also change this frame. Um, like tomorrow's, um, you know, I, I, I mean, what, what's interesting for me, uh, you know, um, is the reflection that I'm getting about this the whole notion of online performances and liveness and you know live in real time and and i guess the one one of you know how, how even if you do try the remote and everything else the the visual entity is still within the frame you know we're, we're still driven by this uh, you know by how we look and how we see and, and i wonder um i mean my my i guess one last question because you know we have about 10 minutes left um you know the idea of um and i think rakini brought it up that pandemic is another privilege you know a space uh, and i thought that was a, a interesting provocation 
um, you know, maybe Rakini, would you like, yeah. Well, I wrote a whole paper on it, so, but I won't bore, <laughs> I won't bore everyone with that. But um, after the last um, pandemic COVID dance conference I gave, that was the thing that struck me the most was the, the fact that, you know, everything was, uh, was, you know, I was feeling really sorry for myself being isolated, but you know, suddenly being zoomed into other people's houses and um, where they just didn't even have internet, where, as I said, you know, they had so many other problems having. So privilege was a huge thing. I was talking to my uh, friend Guillermo Gomez Peña in Mexico, and he was saying it's it was terrible there. Nobody had any... Uh, um, was taking any precautions. Um, again, he said, it's a privilege. He said, we just, uh, isolating is a privilege. Um, and it became this huge debate um, with all these, you know, Asian countries and Australia, we were all discussing and, and we um, started to discuss what the notion of space was. You know, it's from taking it from metaphors of space to actual, physical space to then, you know, the virtual space. And the same thing, accessibility became all about privilege. You know, what, what we take for granted in, say, you know, in, in privileged countries or the resources that we have um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously different everywhere. So it just affects that. And that to me, um, and it's also the priorities that different, um, people give to, to each each so that has a real impact on um you know if you are struggling to survive in a physical sense with your mental health with, with just accessing life's necessities you know art seems to be i felt rather um you know i felt guilty and even shallow just thinking about my art you know it's like you know, I've got friends, you know, in India who were suffering and, and um, uh, relatives in, in Asia and things. And I'm, and, you know, so there was, there's all of that, um, that uh, really um, affected me a lot with this, uh, the idea. So that's where the idea of this, uh, the, the ruptures and the erasures, you know, all of these, um, you know, words, because you know, here I think we're sort of almost seamlessly being able to have performances and then also offer the streaming option and uh, all of that. And uh, But in many cases, without travel um, and without actual physical presence, uh, people just can't, um, just cannot, you know, I mean, even it's just, it's not an option. I mean, I've, I've struggled my whole life as an artist, but you know, this added um, challenge because a lot of the work that a lot of independent artists do depends on traveling, whether it's, you know, even just regionally or, you know, nationally or whatever. So it, it has become a huge um, issue, um, you know, sustaining your practice with, with all of this. Thank you. Um, the other two panels, would you like to add anything on to what Rakini has said? Um, just, just very, very briefly. I'm just responding to this sustaining one's practice and thinking about one's practice in this these privileged times. And I think I come back to saying what I said before, which is we haven't listened for long enough to this last year. And maybe an awful lot of things need to be utterly redefined. And we haven't had time yet. We haven't swallowed it yet. But I think we need to be open to, to really rethinking what practice is and what connection is and what, um, what our work needs to be in, as we say, BC before, before Corona and AC after Corona. That's all I, I, I wanted to add. Maria? Yes, I'm happy for Jills to be the last word. All right. Well, uh, we have four minutes left to the panel. Um, I, and, and I think um, I would like to just say thank you 
thank you very much to Jill, Rakini, and Maria. Uh, you've opened up um, a lot of points for us to reflect. And as Jill say, we need some time to really listen and to practice um, and, and, you know, uh, to rethink, I think, uh, what practice is, is also uh, quite crucial because I'm also rethinking my role as a, as a performance maker. Um, you know, as you can see, um, I'm happy to just organize and, and not partake in this online space, you know, in, in another manner because um, I'm afraid, yeah. So, you know, this, this space is, is, is an interesting space to be in. Um, with that, um, I, uh, uh, with that, I think uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. Um, and um, yes, we see you. Um, we have um, block. Oh, sorry, I have to look at my schedule. Sorry. We have block two coming up. Of artist talk. We have a performance by Deborah Hunt. Uh, we have uh, Carolina doing uh, a woman to woman and a work in progress by Mobilize and Demobilize. Uh, so please uh, join us uh, later in the evening. It's at uh, 6 p.m. UK time and 7 p.m. Uh, Europe time. And I will be in bed, but I will see you all tomorrow. Uh, for the, uh, our second day of our panel. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, yes, donations are, are welcome. I just uh, I, I want to say, um, you know, the whole team, we are very, very um, grateful and, and, and felt very encouraged and are very encouraged, actually. We still are very encouraged with the support that we have received. Um, that we can and and now we can use the donations to actually um, you know go at the donations can now go to the artist itself. So thank you very much um, and 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 um, good night and uh, or good evening or good morning wherever you are. And um, yes, if you come to Hong Kong, if you do come to Hong Kong, Tim Sum one 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 Tim Sum is on me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Helen, do you need to say anything? Sorry. Um, well, I, I am the host also of the, of the whole block, so I guess I can just also say thanks very much to everyone. Um, and yeah, the panel was great. Really good to hear everybody's different perspectives. And I, I hope we managed that Marianne and I managed to get everyone's questions from the chat. It was a bit fast for a oh, while. To continue is, and go to the observatory uh, of the yeah observer the, story yeah, yeah. correct um, yes if people are desperate to keep talking the observer story is open maybe Christina if if you're still there could you put the link into it and then people can easily go there um, otherwise we're back here in in three hours for block two um, and we hope that that some of you will be back wanting more and. We are recording, so the chat and the the talks and everything have been recorded. Um, oh, and, and yeah, thank yeah. you to Eugenia for translating. Yeah, very important. I'm yeah. sorry that we were so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, there's there's the link to the observer story for anybody that wants to go and and check it out. It's pretty fun.